Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this latest in MHA's series of tax webinars in private client entrepreneurial business. And um, we've been happily going through the life cycle of, of businesses, um, but we're stepping away from that on this, this occasion to look at year end tax planning. It seems like a good time to do that in February, a little bit of time to do something before the year end. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, it's Patrick King here, as usual. Uh, I'm joined uh, again, as usual, by my colleague, James Kipping, and we have Tony Medcalf, uh, another of our tax partners at MHA, joining us as well to do a bit at the end. So without further ado, we've got, as usual, rather a lot to get through. So we can get to the uh, agenda slide. That would be good. Thanks, James. Um, I'm going to be dealing with income tax and the health and social care levy, just running through those very quickly, and then capital gains tax and tax favoured investments. Then I'll hand over to James to do making tax digital pensions and inheritance tax. And then we'll go to Tony for corporation tax and capital allowances. And we may have a few minutes at the end for a few questions if there are any. Um, but uh, I think time will be a bit tight today because I have so much to do. So if you can have the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, income tax and health and social care levy. Well, if we just look at income tax first, um, this is just the basic information, which I'm sure you're well aware of. I think the thing to point out is the personal allowance is, is, is staying the same now for several years. It'll be there till 2026. So given that we're now experiencing some fairly interesting inflation figures, the value of that is obviously declining. Um, other than that, you can see the tax rates there. You can broadly earn about 50 grand before you start paying higher rates. Um, and you start paying 40% tax. But when you go above 100,000 pounds though, you do start losing your personal allowance. And we'll have a little bit more on that in a second. And also remember, for those of you who have children, uh, you do start losing the child income benefit um, or the child allowance between the incomes of 50,000 and 60,000. So again, a bit more on that in a second. We go to the next slide. So just some planning thoughts. Uh, that's what we're talking about, really, what you can do before the year end. If you are lucky enough, I guess, to have income between 100 and 125,000 pounds a year, then that bit of income between 100 and 125 broadly is effectively taxed at 60%. And the reason for that is you're losing the personal allowance at the rate of one pound for every two pound of income in that, in that band of income. So that, that works out. If you do the maths, you'll see 60% tax. So it seems the most sensible place for you to be paying pension contributions, or maybe if you're charitably inclined, gift aid contributions, because you're getting effectively a 60% relief on those, on those payments if you do that. Uh, similarly, with child allowances, if one spouse in a relationship has income above £50,000, then you start losing the child allowance. It doesn't matter which spouse has that money, it goes to, it, it's lost by whoever's getting the highest amount. Um, and assuming you've got two children, that means between about £50,000 and £60,000, by which time you've lost your allowance completely, again, you've got an effective tax rate of about 60%. If you have three children or four children, that effective tax rate goes up. And in the past, I've worked out, I think you get to around about 100% tax rate effectively. If you have, I think it was either five or eight children, I can't remember now, but uh, the, rate, the rate becomes quite frightening very quickly as you have more children. So again, uh, look to pay pension contributions if you can afford it. If you have the flexibility in your arrangements, then perhaps try and equalize income between husband and wife. Um, if, if both of you have incomes of £49,000, i.e. just under 50, then there is no restriction in your child allowance. Whereas if one of you has income over 50,000, it starts to be restricted, which seems very unfair, but that is the way the rules work. So if you have that flexibility, spread it between the two of you. Um, personal allowances, try and use every year if you can. Again, not everyone has the flexibility to change their income, but if you do, try and make sure you have enough income to use your personal allowance and ideally your basic rate band every year. Uh, and think of the two of you if you're in, if you're in relationships. Um, if you have children, it's worth looking to see if you can use their personal allowances because they have them. Uh, but do remember if the children are under the age of uh, 18 and you as a parent transfer uh, value to them, then that will remain in your income for tax purposes because of settlement rules. So do, do talk to us if you're in that situation, you think you do have the flexibility to transfer income to children. Uh, because it is possible to do, but you have to probably route, route funds through grandparents and trusts and so on. But it certainly can be and it's worth looking at. Um, we have the health, health and social care levy coming up, which I'll talk about in a moment, in a moment but uh, that's an increase in tax, in effect. 
from 5th of April this year. So consider paying dividends before that and maybe having some uh, some extra pay bonus payments before that as well. Although Tony will have some words to say about whether that's a good idea, bearing in mind the increase in corporation tax, which is coming down the track uh, next year. So uh, more on that later. If you have the next slide, please. Right, sorry, yes, I lost, lost track there for a moment. Basis period change. Now, this isn't really year-end planning, but I thought it was relevant to bring it to your attention, particularly those of you are who are self-employed, um, because it's quite a significant change, which for some people is going to be quite painful. From 24-25 tax year, everyone's, everyone who's self-employed is going to have to pay tax on what's called the arising basis, which means whatever income they have in the tax year to the 5th of April is taxed in that year. That is not what happens at the moment. At the moment, you pay tax on your profits per your accounts that end in the tax year. So for instance, the 30th of April 2022 uh, tax uh, accounting period would be taxed in the 22-23 tax year, even though that, that accounting year ends in the first month of that tax year. That's how it works at the moment. So you can see from that, when we move to paying tax on a transition on an arising basis, there's going to have to be a catch up. And that happens in the tax year 23-24. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, I thought some figures might make this easier to understand. So if we look at someone in the transitional year there and they have a 30th of April year end, which happens to be the worst one for this purpose. So that's why I'm using it. Someone has a 30th of April year end, they would normally expect in, in the 23-24 tax year to pay tax on their profits in their accounts for 30th of April 2023 they are the accounting that's the accounting period ending in 23 24 tax year if we assume in that year they have 50,000 pounds profit in the year to 30th of april 24 let's assume they have 75,000 pounds of profit and there are overlap profits of 10,000 pounds now overlap profits are, are the profits that have been taxed effectively twice when you started the business you don't need to worry about that for this purpose, but if you have a 30th of April year end, you almost certainly will have some overlap profits, which your accountant will know about. Uh, and you get relief for those when you change your year end or some rule change happens like this, which is why I mentioned it. Let's assume that's 10,000 pounds. It often is a relatively low number because it usually relates to some time in the past. So what will you be taxed on in 23, 24? Well, you start off with your accounting period to 5th of April 23, which gives you 50,000 pounds. But then you have to add in all the profits between the 1st of May 2023 and the 5th of April 2024. So you time a portion your profits to 30th of April 24, and that's a 340 over 365 calculation, which brings in just short of £70,000 into the 23-24 tax calculation. We then knock off the £10,000 of overlap relief, which leaves you taxable 109863 compared to what you started with and what you'd normally expect, 50,000. So that's a huge increase, obviously. Now, fortunately, there is some relief here. That extra 59,000 odd pounds, the difference between 50 and 109, can be spread over the next five years. So that's 11, just under 12,000 pounds each year. But even there, you can see that's a significant increase to your taxable profits year on year caused by this change from the current year basis to the arising basis. So all we're saying to people at this stage is be aware of it, think about it, if there's anything we can do to plan to make it less painful, then let's try and do it. Uh, next slide, please. So onto the health and social care levy. Uh, you've, you all have heard about this, I'm sure, to help pay for the crisis in the, the NHS uh, and health and social care generally, uh, the government's decided to increase uh, national insurance initially by one and a quarter percent from 5th of April. Um, technically, it won't be national insurance from the following year because it's going to be national insurance is going to be reduced back to the normal level again and a new levy of 1.25 put in its place. But think of it as national insurance because it effectively is. It's treated like it and, and applies in a very similar way. So it will, everyone will have to pay this if they are uh, earning money above the primary threshold, which is currently £9,568. And it also applies to dividend income. So even if you have no earned income, you do have dividend income, you will be paying this extra one and a quarter percent. And it carries on, you have to carry on paying this if you're an employee, even after a normal retirement age. So it is the first time there are um, 
and there is a liability to what is in effect national insurance after normal retirement age of the employee and the employer has to pay as well so it's quite a significant increase in the employer's cost you are allowed to set the employer allowance against it uh, as you are for, for national insurance it can also apply against the social care levy that is the four thousand pound relief you have as an employer to help pay for your the cost of employing people basically um, so just be aware of that it's coming in from 5th of april I can have the next slide, please. So into capital gains tax. Um, again, we have annual allowances. 12,300 is the current capital gains tax allowance. And that again is frozen until 2026. So depending on what the inflation rate is over the next few years, that will obviously be worth considerably less in 2026 than it is now. Uh, as with the personal allowance, it's a use or lose. So if you can, try and create enough capital gains each year to use up your annual allowance. You can't carry it forward, so you try and use it. Um, I've got bed and breakfasting mentioned there. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware you can't simply sell some stocks and securities to create a gain and buy the same ones back the next day. That doesn't work because there are rules to prevent you doing it. But what you can do is either wait more than 30 days before you buy them back, uh, which you probably wouldn't want to do because of investment risk, or better than that, um, if husband sells and then wife immediately buys, that's okay. Uh, that, that works. So you can still bed and breakfast or bed and spouse it, as we call it, um, to, to get that, that benefit if you wish to. Uh, the tax rates currently are 10% and 20%, uh, and, and 18 and 28% if you're looking at uh, residential property. So they're not too bad. And at the moment, we're not seeing them rise rapidly in the future, although we have obviously been talking about that quite a lot in recent seminars, or webinars rather. Uh, the fear, I think, of big rises has, has probably subsided a bit now. Uh, if you make a capital loss, you can use it in the year you make the loss, or you can carry it forward forever. But the important thing to remember, the reason I thought it's worth mentioning in this webinar, was you do have to claim it. Uh, you have to claim it within four years of the end of the tax year of loss. Uh, if you don't, you lose it. So make sure that is claimed. Uh, if you have uh, some assets that have become effectively worthless, uh, you can't sell them. You may be able to claim a capital loss by what's called a negligible value claim. So if you are in that situation, you've got something, you paid a lot of money for it, it's now not worth anything, you can't get rid of it. Do have a word with us because it is possible you'll be able to make a claim. And sometimes you can get income tax relief on those as well. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, business assets. Um, we've talked about this previously, so just very quickly, it's just not a year end thing. Uh, business asset disposal relief, where you are disposing of assets that qualify for it, so uh, your interest in a trading partnership or, or self-employment, or your shareholding in a trading company, for instance, can potentially qualify for a 10% tax rate on the first million pounds of gain. And that's a million pound lifetime limit. So all we say here really is um, just look at the qualifying conditions regularly, make sure your business does still qualify, try to avoid doing anything that stops it qualifying. So it's just worth a review, uh, perhaps annually or every couple of years to make sure you're okay there. Uh, if we can move on. PPR, I mentioned this, uh, again, it's not really a year end thing, but people are buying second homes like No Tomorrow at the moment, uh, coming out of London and so on. Uh, you are able when you buy a second home or a third home for that matter, to make an election as to which of your various homes you would like to be your principal private residence. And as you no doubt know, principal private residence does not have any capital gains tax on it at the moment. So it's worth every time you change the number of homes you have, looking at the situation to see whether or not it would be beneficial to move which is regarded as your principal private residence between them. You do have to make that election within two years of acquiring a further home. And that's the important thing to remember, which is why I, which is why I mentioned it. So just if you are buying second homes, make sure that is given some thought. Uh, I can go on the next slide, please. So briefly on tax favoured investments, just about doing OK on time so far. Um, these are largely annual, but not all annual things. Uh, ISAs, independent individual savings account, £20,000 per year. That's quite a decent uh, limit now that you can put in. Uh, and as you know, that no, uh, it, once you've got money into an ISO, it's not taxed and there's no capital gains if you're in stocks and shares. It's the use or lose. So if you have the ability to do it and you've used up your pension allowance, uh, then I heartily recommend using your individual savings account allowance as well uh, of £20,000 a year. 
There are various derivatives of the ISA. Uh, there's the help to buy ISA, which has largely been phased out now, but it's still there if you had one before the rules changed, I think in 2019. And there's the lifetime ISA as well, or LISA, uh, which is available for those under 40, uh, which doesn't include me, and therefore I'm not particularly interested in talking about it. But if it is relevant to you, uh, please get in touch. Um, then we get to slightly more interesting reliefs, which are there to encourage people to invest in smaller, unquoted trading companies. First, we have Enterprise Investment Scheme, or EIS, where you can put up to a million pounds per year in, so it is relevant on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, for your, your, your incentive to do this, bearing in mind you're potentially investing in unquoted and smaller company shares, I mean, they're small but not tiny, they have to have less than 15 million of gross assets. Uh, so they still quite can be quite substantial businesses. But to give you the incentive to do that, the government will give you a 30% income tax relief for whatever you invest up to that million pounds. Uh, you also can defer any capital gains you've made uh, in that year or the previous three years, um, which is quite valuable. Um, and when you sell the EIS shares, other than gains you've perhaps deferred into it, there is no capital gain. So it really is quite a powerful relief. Uh, and I've got an example in a minute, which sort of shows how that can be um, even more beneficial than you might think. For very small companies, uh, assets less than £200,000, so here we are talking about seriously early stage companies and it's, it's real risk. Uh, the limits are only £100,000 that you can put in, um, but you get a 50% income tax relief, so that's quite, that's quite an incentive. Plus, you can still defer capital gains, as you can with EIS, but provided you meet the rules for the relevant period, broadly three years after you've invested, then 50% uh, of that gain becomes completely exempt, which is not the case for EIS. And so that, again, is quite a, quite a powerful relief if you are interested in that, in that small company size. Um, the thing that really interests me about EIS in particular, but also SEIS, I suppose, is that uh, after you've had these shares in these EIS companies for more than two years, it, you will probably qualify for business property relief, which is 100% exemption from inheritance tax. Uh, which, which as we'll show in, in an example in a moment, quite, quite, um, quite interesting. Uh, there's also venture capital trusts, which is it's kind of like a pension in a way. Uh, it's into a, a basket of investments. VCTs are quoted companies in their own right. They invest in, in a number of EIS type companies. Uh, you can put in up to £200,000 a year. You get the 30% income tax. Um, there's no capital gains tax deferral here and you don't get business property relief but there's no tax at all basically on what comes out of the VCT going forward provided you do hold it for the relevant period of time uh, and it, it meets all the rules which hopefully you would do so again that's quite an interesting uh, interesting way to invest part of your part of your funds but if you go to the next slide let's uh, just a little example on why EIS type funds can be used to quite considerable advantage. Let's assume we have a lady, Mrs. Williams, she's 85 years old. Uh, she has a share portfolio of a million pounds. Uh, she doesn't need it. She's got plenty of other wealth and assets. Um, she has potential IHT, inheritance tax, on that million pounds of shares of 400,000 pounds. That's the rate of inheritance tax, 40%. And there are capital gains in that portfolio of investments of let's say half a million pounds. She's a very fortunate lady. She has income of 250,000 per annum on which she pays income tax of around about 97,000 pounds. So if we go to the next slide. If she were to sell her portfolio of shares and buy a million pounds of EIS shares, the gains of 400,000 pounds that I mentioned in the previous slide can be deferred into that 1 million pound investment in EIS. So she won't have to pay any capital gains tax at that point in time. She will also get income tax relief of up to £300,000. Now, she's paid £97,000, we know, in the, in the year. Uh, that's that based on her income of £250,000. So that will be covered. Uh, she can carry back relief for one year. So she can potentially get £97,000 from the year before if she paid that amount of income, in the, income tax in the previous year. Um, and in reality, she might well invest into the EIS shares over more than one year such that she can probably catch uh, 97,000 pounds of income in the next year as well, if she, if she invests part of these EIS in the next year. The ability to defer the gain made in year one can be carried forward for up to three years. So she'll be able to get that relief, even though she perhaps invests 
in EIS shares over more than one year. If she keeps those shares until she dies, and let's say she dies three years later, she is an elderly lady after all, then what is the benefit to her? Well, there's no inheritance tax on her holding of a million pounds at EIS shares because they qualify for BPR. So she's immediately saved 400,000 pounds of inheritance tax. The capital gains tax, which she deferred and which would have become payable had she sold the EIS shares while alive, is now wiped out because she's died and there's no capital gains tax on death. And she's also had income tax relief of at least 97,000 pounds being the income tax paid in the year uh, that she did the sale of her own shares and started investing in EIS. So at the least, she should get £577,000 of tax relief on her million pound investment. Uh, and it's likely, I would say, based on what I said earlier, that she could possibly increase that by another £200,000 by bringing in two more years. So very powerful, worth looking at, as long as you understand the risks that you're taking, which uh, perhaps not, it's not too serious given the amount of tax relief you have. Uh, next slide, please. I thought so. Yes, that's brought my bit to an end, a uh, minute over time. So I'll hand you over now to James to talk through making tax digital, etc. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, the first sort of short section on my talk will be about making tax digital. It's not a not a year end tax planning point uh, per se, but it's um, but I think it's more it, it, it's it's an awareness point and perhaps the end of the tax year. Um, is an appropriate time for people who might be affected by the next phase of uh, making tax digital to start planning ahead for future years. So just to sort of run through the slide here, you know, it's not just for VAT. Now, if you, if you remember making tax digital for VAT was the first step in the MTD program and businesses with taxable supplies over the VAT threshold have been required to report digitally um, since 1st of April, 2019. And the purpose of MTD um, is said to be to move the UK towards um, a fully digital tax system, reporting more information in real time. And cynically, I would assume that eventually it will lead to us all paying in real time or certainly much sooner than we do at the moment. But what, what, what's the issue for, for income tax or what's the next stage? So from, from April 2024, um, and this has been deferred uh, from April 2023, um, individuals with businesses or, or and or rental income over um, £10,000 per annum will need to make quarterly reports to H HMRC under um, making, tax making Tax Digital for Income Tax. Um, general partnerships will follow in 2025 and as yet there's no date um, for LLPs, although I, I, I expect that that will come along with um, when companies and corporation tax are brought into um, MTD, possibly from 2026, um, but we don't know for sure. So how is quarterly reporting done or how will it be done? Essentially, there must be a digital record for each transaction. That doesn't mean people have to, or rather it doesn't mean people cannot continue to keep manual records, but there then must be some digital record, if only in spreadsheet form, which is then used to facilitate the quarterly reporting. Uh, for many though, and I think this is where the kind of planning comes in, this is an opportunity for businesses or smaller businesses in particular to adopt perhaps a cloud-based accounting system. So preparing early could help you make sure that the MTD changes are, are more than just an admin cost. So it might be that moving on to such a system either at the start of the coming tax year or at the start of the next tax year, in other words at least a year in advance of MTD, is administratively the most straightforward um, way to prepare if you prepare accounts uh, to 31st of March or 5th of April. Um, in terms of what needs to be submitted, you know, what, what do these quarterly reports entail? You know, it's, it, it's nothing more than a summary of income and expenses on a quarterly basis. So the, the complicated bit, the tax adjustments, are not mandated uh, as, far as, as far as quarterly reporting is concerned. And therefore, an end of year statement, essentially the tax return, um, is still going to be required. So for most taxpayers, most of our our clients who are affected, they're unlikely to notice a significant change in their year-end compliance process as a result. Um, what, are, what are MHA doing? You know, we're starting to plan for clients who will be affected by um, making tax digital for income tax. And I think at this stage, all I would say is we'll be contacting clients over the next few months to provide a bit more information about what the changes will mean for them and what our, what our service offering will be. 
Um, I'm aware that HMRC said last year that they too will contact taxpayers in the early part of 2022. I, I, I don't know whether they've now deferred that um, in light of the general deferral of MTD for income tax from 2023 to 2024. But I suppose this is just a heads up. Let's move on to pensions. Now, clients listening will know that I'm keen for them to take full advantage of what are still really generous tax reliefs available on pension contributions. Now, I'm going to focus here on contributions into a personal pension fund, for example, a SIP and the associated income tax relief as set out on the slide here in, in, in front of you. Obviously, there are you know, occupational or final salary schemes. I'm, I'm not going to cover those um, today in the interest of keeping this in, in time. I think I have 20 minutes. Um, so tax relief is given as follows on personal or rather contributions into a personal pension fund. Contributions can be made by an employer. Now, that's, that's, that's an employer, I suppose, in the true sense or, 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 or perhaps from a personal company. Um, and they will form tax-free benefits. In other words, there's no extraction taxes, no income tax and national insurance payable on, on pension contributions. Contributions can, of course, be made personally, um, where the method of providing relief is a little more complex. Um, basic rate income tax relief is given as an additional contribution to the pension fund. Um, and um, higher rate relief is given via self-assessment or by the tax return, okay? How relief is given for personal contributions is probably best illustrated in an example. Although I would say, I suppose, before I go through the example, that employer contributions are often slightly more tax efficient because they do not incur national insurance contributions. Whereas, of course, if, if contributions are paid personally from, let's say, net salary, that salary has suffered NI. So where, where you have a personal company, often we'll be advising you to make contributions from the company rather than, than personally. In fact, most often. Um, and of course, this, this, this NI saving has led to many businesses putting in place salary sacrifice schemes for pension contributions. So, so that's another point. And again, not, not really a year end point, but if you're an employer, um, um, consider a salary sacrifice scheme for your pension contributions for um, um, employees' pensions. Um, to go through the example though, in other words, how personal pension contributions attract tax relief, Let's say there's an individual with employment income. I've put there on the slide 100,000, but that's not really relevant. Um, let's say they make an 8,000 pounds net personal pension contribution into their SIP. Okay, the SIP will recover um, the basic rate relief. So it will recover 2,000 pounds of basic rate relief as an additional contribution to the, to the SIP. The higher rate relief at 40% in this case um, is given by extending the basic rate band. Now, that is the band of income that's taxed at 20% rather than 40%. So the effect of that is that the taxpayer um, gets an additional £2,000 of relief via their tax return. Therefore, the net cost of a £10,000 gross contribution is £6,000 um, to the taxpayer. Now, there are... Um, restrictions to what contributions you can get um, tax relief on. And um, here I'm talking about the, the, the annual allowance, which is um, essentially the limit on how much money you can contribute into your pension in any one year while still benefiting from tax relief. Doesn't mean you can't contribute more, you just won't get tax relief. So generally we wouldn't advise contributing in, in excess of the annual allowance. Now it's currently 40,000 pounds for most people, but for personal contributions, if earnings, that's salaried income or self-employment income, in, in other words, not investment income, are lower than 40,000, you will only be able to be entitled to tax relief up to the amount you earn. Having said that, there's a minimum allowance for everyone, which is £3,600 gross or £2,880 before the basic rate tax relief is added. Um, a further complication is that the annual allowance is tapered for high earners. So whilst there's a kind of £40,000 starting point, that is reduced by £1 for every £2 that someone's what we call adjusted income exceeds £240,000. Now adjusted income is essentially taxable income, so salary, investment income, etc., plus any employer pension contributions. When you apply that allowance, the minimum allowance though is £4,000. But importantly, and this is where planning often comes in. Unused allowances from the previous three tax years 
can be carried forward um, to be used in a single year. So this means that ahead of the end of this tax year, 5th of April 2022, for some clients, it's potentially possible to contribute as much as £160,000 into their pension fund with the benefit of tax relief. So what are the planning opportunities? Obviously, the tax reliefs um, are obvious. Um, but in terms of planning op opportunities, pension contributions provide tax reliefs in most situations. But the example on the, on the slide here is one where 60% tax relief is available. So this is kind of the, optim <coughs> the optimum situation. And Patrick, Patrick mentioned it briefly um, at, at the start of his talk. Going through the example there, if an individual has income of say £125,000 or roughly, or even precisely £125,000, their income is at the optimum level for maximising the tax relief because they're right at the upper end of the band of income in which their personal allowance is abated. So as on the second bullet point here, the personal allowance is reduced for, uh, by £1 for every £2 that income exceeds £100,000. So the result is, <coughs> excuse me, that the effective rate of tax on this income is 60%. But it also means that 60% relief is available on contributions up to £25,000. Well, what does, what does this mean in terms of, in terms of, in terms of you know, the cost of contributions? So if that particular individual made a personal pension contribution of £20,000, that would be increased by £5,000 basic rate tax relief being added to the fund to make a gross contribution of 25. A further 10,000 pounds of higher rate relief, that's 40% of 25,000, is available by reducing the income tax liability on their tax return, for example. So the final point there confirms that in this kind of optimum situation, the cost of a 25,000 pounds pension contribution is just 10,000 pounds to the taxpayer. The second kind of Planning opportunities, if you like. And this is this is one where where we, we, we quite regularly having having conversations with clients with personal companies, where perhaps they've built profits up in the company. They're looking at how to extract <coughs> those profits most efficiently. Um, and we've said before that employer contributions can generally be the most tax efficient way of making contributions. Let's let's take this example here. You have an individual with a personal company company's profits for the for the current year let's say three hundred thousand um, pounds uh, or so but that's not really entirely relevant no pension contributions have been made either employer contributions or personal contributions in the previous three tax years so this particular individual is in the situation where they're the maximum contribution that they can make in the current tax year unless their personal income and for this purpose, we ignore the company's profits. Their personal income um, is above 240,000. The maximum they can, they can contribute is four times 40,000 annual allowance, 160,000. Now, that could be paid as a pension contribution from the company as a tax free benefit. The company should benefit from a corporation tax deduction for that contribution. So, saving 30,400 pounds in corporation tax, that's at the, the current 19% rate. I would just kind of mention or caveat that and say the contributions need to be wholly and exclusively um, for the uh, purposes of the company's business to get that corporation tax deduction. But provided there are sufficient profits, either current year profits or possibly brought forward reserves, I think it's very, very difficult for HMRC to argue that a large pension contribution for an owner manager in the sort of owner manager situation does not constitute reasonable or commensurate remuneration. So we do see this type of planning done, done quite regularly where people find themselves in this situation. <coughs> I sort of finally on pensions um, mention the lifetime allowance, which is a further restriction on the tax relief available as it's the limit on how much you can build up in a pension or rather build up in pension benefits over your lifetime while still enjoying the full tax benefits. Now, the, the, the current lifetime allowance is £1.073 million pounds or thereabouts. <coughs> but in the same way as Patrick said that the um, 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 tax bans have been frozen, so too has this lifetime allowance. 
So more and more um, um, taxpayers' pensions are going to be brought into what we call annual allowance charges over the next five years. If you exceed that allowance, <coughs> generally you'll pay a tax charge on the excess. And I say here at certain times, it's at what we call benefit crystallisation events, basically when you access the fund in retirement or at age 75, broadly. The excess over the annual allowance or the, the, the lifetime allowance <coughs> is taxed at either 25% or 55%, depending on how you access those, those benefits. And it's basically to claw back the, the um, um, relief you've had during, during the, the period you've been contributing. Certain protections, though, for the lifetime allowance have been available over the years. Um, as the lifetime allowance has reduced to its to its current level, it used to be a lot higher. In fact, there didn't used to be a lifetime allowance at all. <laughs> one, one awareness point is just be aware. If you're in a situation where you have one of these protections, particularly enhanced protection, which is particularly valuable, um, those protections say, or rather those protections are lost if you contribute to a pension fund. So just be aware of auto enrollment. So if you are employed, and I have a few, few clients who are non-exec directors in many, many companies, and they have to be, take particular care to opt out of auto enrolment, because if they didn't and contributions were made to a, a pension fund for them, then they would potentially lose their enhanced protection. So as I say, it, it's more of an awareness point, but given that employers are required to offer auto enrolment every two years, it's necessary to opt out each time. So it's something that should continually be on your mind if you're potentially affected by this. I've only got three minutes or so left and I'm gonna, wanted to cover inheritance tax. Um, first couple of slides here deal with kind of inheritance tax or what inheritance tax is or how it's charged at a, at a very high level. Um, I'll try and skip through in the interest of getting to the kind of planning opportunities. But basically inheritance tax or IHT um, is the tax due on chargeable lifetime gifts or on the value or rather, and on the value of an estate of someone who has died. So no IHT will be due, due generally if the value of your estate, including any gifts made in the previous seven years before death, are less than what we call the nil rate band threshold of £325,000 or if you leave everything above the threshold to your spouse because transfers to spouses are exempt. Of course, all that's really doing is pushing the inheritance tax exposure or liability or problem, if you like, to the, to the survivor of, 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 of the two of you. And if you give away your home or rather bequeath your home <coughs> to direct descendants, that 325,000 threshold can be increased by 175,000 by what we call the residence nil rate band. So that um, where that's available, and it's not available to large estate, uh, large estates, but where it is available, it's possible that a, that a married couple has a total allowance of a million pounds. But everything in excess of that is chargeable at 40% unless it qualifies um, for a relief. And I'm going to skip over here, first of all, to the bottom bullet point. And in particular, um, assets that qualify for business property relief or agricultural property relief will usually not be chargeable to inheritance tax. There is a 50% business property relief um, in certain situations, but as I say, I'd rather, I'd rather talk about the, the planning opportunities rather than the, the sort of intricate detail of how in, inheritance tax works. I would just mention though that <clears throat> gifts, a lifetime gifts uh, are generally what we call potentially exempt transfers. So gifts of cash, for example, are not immediately chargeable, but the transfer or must survive seven years for the full value of that gift to fall out of their estates. Otherwise, the 40% tax rate applies on the value of the gift, and that tax, if there is tax on gifts in the seven years before death, is tapered to the, um, depending upon um, um, the length of time between the um, um, gift and death. So if you survive more than three years, there's an element of tapering. Certain gifts, though, can be covered by exemptions. So gifts between spouses are exempt and civil partners. Gifts of up to £3,000 per annum are, 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 are essentially um, ignored, covered by what we call the annual exemption. And the annual exemption should be carried forward for one year. But in terms of a year-end tax planning point, you know, it's small, but make sure you've used that if inheritance tax is a, is a concern for you. <clears throat> There's a small gifts exemption of up to £250 per person. Gifts to charity are exempt. The one I wanted to mention as kind of a final point here 
is gifts which qualifies normal expenditure out of income. Um, so where, where you're making gifts out of what we call normal um, expenditure out of income, so they're gifts that don't that, that are out of income, so surplus income and don't don't um, don't sort of um, eat into capital, um, then they they are also exempt. Um, I've listed there on the slide the conditions for this uh, section 21 of the Inheritance Tax Act and the authority in um, Bennett and HMRC um, um, in back in 1995. But basically, that says that the the the, the gifts have to form an established pattern, or there has to be um, a, a clear commitment or intention for gifts to form such um, an established pattern. So it might be that you decide, well, I'm going to give regularly 10% of my surplus income to my, my children, <clears throat> or I'm going to make a commitment to pay the grandchildren's school fees. Um, those types of gifts provided out of income should be exempt from inheritance tax. And actually over a long period of time, they add up or can add up to a very significant figure. Record keeping is important, obviously. I'll raise that, raise that um, every time. Um, and as a final, final planning point, and I, 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 this is something I use regularly, so apologies if you've You've heard this before, but what about gifts into a pension fund for grandchildren? So if you look at the example on this final slide, <clears throat> because everyone, including children who, who aren't earning necessarily, um, have, a, have, a, have an annual allowance for pension contributions of £3,600, many clients of mine <clears throat> contribute that £2,880 per annum out of income, so exempt gift from inheritance tax, the tax relief is added, or basic rate tax relief is added by HMRC of £720 to bring you up to the gross contribution of 3600 If you do that over the first 18 years of, of a grandchild's life before they go into work themselves, for example, total contributions are 51840 they're IHT exempt, along with their all, all growth in value. Tax relief is added, 12,920, um, obviously that's hopefully grown in value as well. Total contributions in that time, 64,800 pounds. And if we assume compound growth at 5% until age 65, that leaves the grandchild with a million pounds pension pot um, um, by virtue of those contributions in the first 18 years of, of their life. So something, something to think about. And on that note, and a little belatedly, I hand over to um, Tony. Thank you, James. Uh, just conscious of time, just obviously wanted to make sure that uh, if anybody's got any questions, uh, they, they can ask them at the end of the session. So I will uh, attempt to, to rattle through corporation tax and, and capital allowances. Thought it'd be useful just to summarise some of the main thoughts um, that came out of the Budget 21 uh, that actually are very relevant to the next couple of years for corporation tax and, and capital allowances. The, the, the original intention was to um, effectively recoup, recoup public finances. Um, and as a consequence of that, we, we are going to see uh, medium term increases in the rate of corporation tax. I'll just touch on that later. Um, however, to, to counteract that and also to assist uh, potentially in companies uh, trying to recover some previous tax paid, uh, there's been measures introduced, short term measures to, to encourage investment being the super deduction, most people will be aware of. Um, for companies, uh, a continuation of the um, annual investment allowance, which is very helpful, and also acceleration of relief on um, special rate assets, which are usually assets that uh, one finds in, in buildings. Um, and then and finally, obviously, as a consequence of the pandemic, there are a number of uh, struggling businesses and the, the ability for those businesses, whether being incorporated or, or, or unincorporated, uh, an extension of the, the loss carryback um, reliefs. So before I just go on to corporation tax, I mean, as I say, the, the main thrust really for corporation tax planning for the coming years will be the interaction of do, do we invest now? Do we claim allowances on that investment now? Do we then use those claims if we do that to carry, carry um, losses back uh, under that enhanced scheme uh, to, to get some tax back? But will will be at lower tax rates, particularly in corporation tax. You know, you'll only be recovering tax at nineteen, or do we uh, think about carrying those those losses forward and and get corporation tax relief at, at much higher rates that are expected to come in? 
So just touching on corporation tax. Sorry, James, I've, uh, I want to just, to just talk about the corporation tax. Thank you. So yes, the main rate of corporation tax uh, from April 2023 is to increase from 19 to 25%. Um, any businesses with a, with a profit of less than 50,000 uh, will be uh, still paying the, the same rate at 19. Um, however, there is a tapered relief uh, between um, 50,000 pound and 250,000 pound profits. And that taper rate, in order to be able to go from 19% to 25% within that, that um, profit level is 26.5%. So, many companies might find themselves actually paying a rate um, in those in that profit range of 26.5% as opposed to the current 19. So that's a significant hike. It's a 40% increase in tax rates for companies. Um, so therefore, um, that 7.5% that is, is what I was trying to allude to really, which would be the, the main thrust between um, finance directors, business owners and, and their advisors as to, as to whether to take benefits now or, or take them in the, or actually take a higher relief in the future. So um, yeah, I just thought it'd be worth just showing that the, the, the main rate from April 17 was 19, it's gonna go up to 25% there. Now, finally, the bit at the bottom, bans tapered for associated companies. Well, this is where um, probably a lot of companies will be um, caught. Um, the introduction of the new corporation tax rates and the marginal rate take us back to the heady days of 2014 and before, uh, where we had the delights of calculating marginal rate relief, we had to work out the number of associated companies because uh, associated companies, which are effectively uh, a company that is either co controls another company or both companies are under the control of the same person or group of persons, well, they are associated. And the consequence of their association reduces those bands um, the 50,000 and the 250,000. Back in 2014, when we had the same system, those bands were actually much higher. They were 300,000 for the basic rate and 1.5 million for the upper rate. So I think that we're probably going to find a number, the vast majority of companies, finding themselves in this, this accelerated rate of the marginal rate or, or even the full rate of 25%. Next slide, please, James. So, as I've said before, generally the, the, the normal thrust when we have got a standard rate of corporation tax and, and have visibility of that going forward is to reduce that because obviously it reduces the, the cash outflow as a consequence of, of uh, corporation tax. So we, we need to look at capital allowances on, on capital acquisitions and I'll just talk about that in a little bit more detail later. Research and development. Um, you know, research and development, I'm sure you've probably heard a number of times, but it's worth keep reiterating, um, you know, successive governments are trying to improve the productivity of, of the UK economy and as a consequence of that and, and move us into a high tech economy. So any, any allowances available for companies and companies only to, uh, to actually expend on research and development is warmly welcomed and, and therefore it, it continues to be a backbone of um, corporation tax planning uh, for, for many of our clients to, to in, in some respects, identify whether particular um, projects do actually qualify um, and then ultimately then identify what expenditure is actually available. So it is a, a, a fundamental plank of determining corporation tax um, at the moment. We've then got the normal um, deductions, um, income movements. I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of, of, of provisions for bad debts, provisions for stock. They're, they're pretty normal in, in a normal year end planning for companies. Uh, I suppose, you know, just talking about uh, what, I've, what I've said before, that those normal conventions potentially subject to um, reporting of profits you know, requirements that a company might have, but obviously, uh, historically, um, decent provisions, specific provisions against bad debts and stock, as examples, uh, have reduced the liability corporation tax. However, that might, um, in some respects, be reversed and turned on its head as a consequence of the, of the, of the new proposals on the rates. 
Just one thing that, uh, just picking up on uh, what Patrick said, um, we, we're aware of the social care levy that's coming in. Uh, normally bonuses um, and the accrual of bonuses provide us with corporation tax relief in any one year, providing that the uh, bonus are physically paid through PAYE within nine months of the year end. Um, we might see an acceleration of said bonuses uh, before the end of this tax year as a consequence of national insurance rates going up by 1.25 for both employers and employees. So that's certainly a, a consideration around um, corporation tax and income tax planning for, for directors and, and, um, and senior employees. Again, then just touching on um, something that James mentioned, which he, he, he talked about employer contributions into pensions. Uh, pension contributions for a company are, are only deductible when they're actually paid. And as a consequence of the ability to carry forward unused allowances in previous years, the previous three years, is there some thought now that certainly pension contributions um, for directors, if you can put the, the £40,000 limit in, is there some thought now to not making those contributions at the moment and carrying uh, that right to make those contributions forward? get beyond the 1st of April 2023 when corporation tax relief um, could potentially be seven and a half percent better off. So in James's example, and any individual that's got, you know, £160,000, which is four years worth of pension contributions, at seven and a half percent, that's that's £12,000 worth of reduction in, in corporation tax. So it's certainly something to uh, consider in the context of, um, you know, how, how we and we look at corporation tax relief going forward. Um, one of the measures, as I, as I said at the beginning of the, the presentation, was the, the extension of the loss carryback. Um, current, before the pandemic, businesses could only carry the, uh, the losses back one year. However, there's an extension of that for, for three years. Um, it's a maximum of two million pound per annum uh, and, and groups are subject to that cap um, across the group. Any, any accounting years that are shorter than the 12 months that we're carrying back to uh, is not is not prorated. So that's that's quite helpful for shorter accounting periods. However, it, it's notable that that period is soon to come to an end. Um, and we've been in it obviously during the two years of, of the pandemic. Uh, so therefore, really, we're only talking about accounting years ending 31st of March 2022 and before. So um, it, it's certainly something to look at for those, those businesses that have either got a February or, or March year end um, and consider all the things that I've just previously mentioned, uh, you know, impacts on profits um, and, and capital expenditure that I'll come on to that may well enhance those losses and access uh, the previous corporation tax that we've been paying at 19 uh, or, or uh, argument it, really thinking about whether we take it, take it forward. Um, one thing that probably most people uh, weren't aware of, I, I don't know, in, in that instance is, is that for claims less than 200,000, normally when you're, you're trying to uh, claim a loss relief, um, you need to have the accounts signed, you need to have a corporation tax then submitted with, with signed accounts. However, for losses of less than 200,000, those claims can be made outside of the tax return principally to, to en enable companies to um, maximize um, the ability to get cash back um, earlier rather than later. And HMRC uh, are quite happy to, to see reasonable management accounts um, to, to substantiate such losses. So that's, that's something worth, uh, worth considering for, for those people that are, might be in that unfortunate position. Next slide, please, James. So just, just going on to capital allowances, um, I think it's just in, interesting to uh, talk about actually when allowances are available on, on the acquisition of, of, of plant and equipment. Uh, the normal rule is that the expenditure is incurred on the date in which the obligation becomes payable and it becomes un unconditional effectively, sorry. So that's usually either delivery uh, or invoice date. A person uh, buying goods is legally required to pay for them on delivery unless there is a special arrangement as of terms of payment. And if the buyer is legally required to pay on delivery, the obligation becomes unconditional when the goods are delivered. So that's the, the, the fundamental point. Um, 
There is an exception to this rule. If, if there actually is a gap of more than four months between the invoice date and the payment date, and the expenditure is not incurred until the date on which the payment is required to be made. So that's, again, in, in view of the short-term measures, in particular the super deduction, something to be aware of because um, we've only got um, another year to, to obviously maximise allowances if, we, if that's what we're seeking to do. So just going on to the super deduction, well, they're only available to companies, I'm afraid. Um, and um, it's in, in respect of expenditure for a two year period from the 1st of April 2021 to the 31st of March 23. So uh, we, we have um, just over a year, 14 months to, to, to get that expenditure in. Um, I'm sure that um, many of you thinking of making a capital expenditure are probably acutely aware of um, delivery times uh, is certainly something that uh, many of my clients are um, are conscious of, and, and really, you know, given given the shortage and the, and the, and the impact that the pandemic's had on supply chains, making orders for plant now or sooner um, really needs to be considered uh, effectively for for delivery uh, by the, by the requisite thirty uh, first of March twenty twenty three. So it's something that that is not necessarily to be delayed, but but thought about now. So what does a super deduction do? It allows 130% deduction for the expenditure on new plant and machinery, um, which would normally qualify for 18% unless they were in the annual investment allowance, which, I, which again, I will come on to in a minute. So as I said, it must be on new plant. Um, so any, any um, second-hand plant, and, and obviously the, there are economic considerations between the, um, the price of new compared to, to second hand. Um, so the, um, it's very, very, very relevant to, to actually think about whether, whether you do buy new or you, you can buy second hand and, and, and then fall within the, the AIA annual investment allowance limits, which I'll touch on in a second. And, and there is no cap uh, on, on the amount that can qualify unlike the annual investment allowance. Uh, there are also accelerated relief for special rates assets uh, in, in property. This is available to property being constructed and used within a, a trading business or even a, a property investment business. And is generally all those items that would normally have got 6% relief, um, but on plant and equipment integrated within, within the building, air conditioning, central heating system, etc. Next slide, please, James. So just, just now to us talking about the annual investments, we, we, we were expecting the annual investment to, to, to be dropping to 200,000, but that again was extended to a million. And that extension has been made till the 31st of March, 2023. So we've got two things running at the moment. We've got the um, special um, super deduction, 130% and 50% for um, integral features. That, uh, that will last till 31st March, 23. And then also, the, the um, annual investment allowance of, of 1 million um, also extended to that period. So it, it, there's a bit of mixing and matching that can actually be applied in corporation tax computation and planning, which, which relief might be used and which is most beneficial. Um, that is if they are new, obviously, because you know, if it's second hand, then you have to go into the annual investment allowance route. But, that, that certainly will be uh, and, and has been what we've been looking at um, from, from many of our clients. So just as an example, uh, looking at the, the impact of, of the AIA. So um, for a year ended December 2023, which spans uh, where it, when it reduces back down, we've got a million pound for the first three months of the year, um, which allows us 250,000 to be spent in, in that period. And then we've got the nine months of, of 200,000 uh, which is another 150, which allows us 400,000. So that's the maximum amount that will, that will fall into AIA um, for the 31st March 2023 period. So if, if, if spend is post March 2023, then the maximum AIA claim is 150,000. So you do need to be careful of when, when expenditure is made. And as I've said before, uh, anything that is new or used can fall into the annual investment allowance. Next slide, please, James. Just worth briefly, just finally, just touching on um, other allowances available to, to companies. Th 
this is specifically the, the the enhanced capital allowances. This is a short term window now, really, for um, for March year end uh, companies. Uh, effectively, the um, enhanced capital allowances on energy saving plants and equipment, uh, low energy light bulbs, etc., uh, was abolished on the first of April twenty twenty. Uh, the normal time claim for, for such allowance claims is, is two years. So 31st March 2022 is the last date in which those claims will be able to be made. So, you know, it's worth reviewing expenditure required uh, to 31st March 2020 and see whether uh, an, an allowance could have been claimed at the old rate of 100%. Obviously, any loss making can then be uh, surrendered um, and if you're a loss making company, you can actually make a claim for a cash tax credit of 13%. However, there are subjects to uh, subject to limits of PAY and NIC paid in the company up to 250,000. Finally, just on just talking about uh, buildings and building construction, we're, we're now um, into a, 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 an arena of, of something similar to the, the old industrial buildings allowances, but it's structure and buildings allowances, which just provides a 3% deduction for against the profits for the construction of non-qualifying plants in the construction of buildings. So uh, most of those buildings, it's any commercial building, essentially non-residential um, and or, or elements of a mixed use building, which are not residential. One thing to note, it's a bit of a sting in the tail in with it. You, you, you do get a annual reduction of 3% um, over the life of the building to a maximum of 33 years um, but the, the the written down allowance actually does reduce the base cost of the property so bearing in mind some of the comments that I've just made um, you know maybe some thought might be given to that in relation to properties that might be thought to be disposed of in the in the near future um, and then might actually fall within the 25 or even 26 and a half percent corporate tax brackets um, whether those allowances are actually claimed. And just finally, just touching on, um, you know, things that might be thought about or considered before the changes to the corporation tax. Um, if, if there are properties that, that, that are in the business and you are considering whether to um, make a sale of that property, then, then certainly um, thinking about making that sale before the 1st of April 2023 would, would be beneficial. Um, because obviously the capital gains, if there are capital gains, will be at, at the lower rates. But also just, just to, uh, to think about planning that you might do in relation to associated companies. I touched on that earlier and the impact on wider associated companies under the common control um, and its impact not only on the rate of corporate tax, but also actually on, on the uh, incidence of tax and whether it brings you into the quarterly payments and therefore requires you to pay tax earlier rather than the normal nine months after the year end. So if, if we've not had to worry so much about that because we've had the fixed um, and flat rate corporation tax rate of 19% for eight years, now that we're moving into this new regime, is it worth thinking about restructures of, of, of groups or, or even associated companies, amalgamating them, whatever, um, just to try and get the number of companies down to, to consider whether that has an impact on on the rates of CT going forward. So um, I think that's the end of, of, of mine. Um, my bit, um, like I said, it was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I, I hope you found it helpful. And, um, and I'll pass you over now to, I think, is it Patrick that's going to, to hold yes, the uh, thanks, thanks. thanks, Tony. <clears throat> thanks, Tony. And uh, thank you everyone for, for bearing with us. We have uh, gone through our full hour, in fact, just slightly over. I don't know if there are very many questions, but uh, if people are willing to hang on, we'll perhaps do a couple, uh, but then we'll, we'll have to bring it to an end because I appreciate people would want to go. Uh, Steve, Steve, are there any questions we can answer quickly at this stage? Um, there are a number. Um, so I shall just choose those which require the briefest answer or, or perhaps are the most interesting. Um, the social care levy, does that apply to uh, dividends from overseas companies? It's a question yes. that's been asked a couple of times. Yes, I, I, I saw that one. I mean, my, my assumption, and it is only assumption, is that it does, but I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that and uh, confirmed it one way or the other. I think it does. I think it's just a general, uh, an increase in the general tax rate. Um, so if we treat it as a dividend rather than uh, some other type of overseas income for tax purposes, I think it will be caught. 
Yeah, that, that was my assumption. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll double check that for, for that particular question. But uh, I think that's most likely. Perhaps just one other, Steve? Uh, just one other. OK. Um, right. Uh, uh, I think it's probably um, James. I think some, someone's uh, slightly picked up the wrong end of the stick regarding the three-year carry forward. I don't know if you mentioned it. Um, but uh, it's about being a pension member and the company have it must pay the contribution rather than accrue it. There are a couple of questions uh, around that area. So if you wouldn't mind clarifying, please. Yeah, good, good point. I was, in, I was skipping through. Um, in order to benefit from the three year carry forward, the individual must have been a member of a registered pension scheme throughout that period. Um, if they weren't a rent member of a registered pension scheme for a particular year, there's no annual allowance available to carry forward. And so that's just the point that we would, we would tick off before, before advising, I think. Um, and the other point there is employer pension contributions qualify for um, corporation tax relief on a, on a paid basis. So um, um, in order to so let's say the company's accounting period um, ends 31st of March 2022, the contributions have to actually be paid in that period for the corporation tax relief to be available in that period. Does that answer the question, Steve? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you very much. Um, right. Um, Patrick, um, well, I think most of them that have been asked for you probably uh, will take too long to answer, but there was one that... Um, if you've missed the two years you mentioned for PPR purposes, what actually happens? Well, yes, that's, that's a good question, actually. Um, I think the, the point to bear in mind there is that the legislation refers to uh, a second or further home. So I have come across cases, I've dealt with cases, in fact, where people have had more than one property for more than two years before this question has been considered. But they've had one they've obviously lived in as their main residence, and the other one um, has been rented out. Now, I take the view, and this may be, uh, may be a serious yeah, dispute with the revenue, but uh, I take the view that if it's rented out, it's not a home because you can't use it. So I think you have two years from when you stop renting it out, not from when you bought it. So the first thing to check is, have you still got any of your two years left? If you haven't, then strictly you just can't make a PPR election. For that particular property so you have to wait until there is another change in the number of properties that you have um, but you can when you when you acquire a third of those things, then all bets are off and you can go back and look at all your properties and decide which one you want to be your your ppr uh, but limit is something to be i hope that answers the question yes thank you uh, oh, yes i think uh, much as uh, much as we'd love to answer more questions uh, and i can still see there's quite a few people on I'm, I'm aware we've gone quite a bit over our time now and people have things to do so uh, i think we'll try to answer further questions uh, by email uh, if you do have any questions obviously please do ask us otherwise thank you for attending our next webinar i think is on expansion overseas so look forward to that one and um, we will see you again in about a month or so's time thank you very much